Welcome to East to West Theology. I'm Dennis G. And, and I'm Kyle is, Dean. And Kyle Dean will open us up in prayer. Oh, come on, man. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's just say he hit his cat. Dude, why'd you have to say that? Now we got to do it all over again. Why? That's so messed up. I didn't mean to hit my cat. Yeah, but it was an accident. <laughs> hey, let's, let's leave it on for the viewers. <laughs> Nazarovia. Salute. Welcome to East to West Theology. I'm Dennis G. And I'm Kyle Dean. Kyle Dean's going to open us up in prayer. All right. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. us. Nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So today we're going to begin our series with St. Joseph, St. Basil, and then move into the saints. We previously left off with Mariology and the Blessed Mother, which we're going to shift into the Holy Family, which is going to end our uh, current state of speaking about the Blessed Mother and her role in theology and move into the St. Joseph. And this is a great unifying point. So with that being said, Kyle Dean, you have a quote to read us. Sure, yeah, just to launch us off, um, for anybody who hasn't already heard about it in the Catholic world, it, it was really a, a cause of firestorm for the year of St. Joseph that mm -hmm. we just came out of recently. Uh, of yes. course, consecration of St. Joseph by the great Father Don Calloway, uh, marrying of the uh, Immaculate... Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, I just have, you know, so many churches still have year of St. Joseph banners. And yeah. I just think they're just going to keep him in there for life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. always going to be the year of St. Joseph. Father Don has definitely uh, made his mark. <laughs> yeah. With and his own uh, imagery in there, too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just want to kick it off with a quote from his book uh, by the great venerable Fulton Sheen uh, on the Holy Family, hmm. where Venerable Sheen says, No husband and wife ever loved one another so much as Joseph and Mary. Uh, and this is, of course, in one of his great chapters, uh, touching on uh, a lesser known of, of current feast of the, um, the wedding, the marriage feast of Mary and Joseph, uh, which is celebrated on January 23rd mm. of each year. But more importantly, just to, to kick off this conversation, this whole idea that no one has ever loved each other in a marriage more than Mary and Joseph really tells us everything we need to know about studying this relationship or just coming into a, a communion, a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary and her spouse, St. Joseph, mm -hmm. in order to understand, you know, I, what we need to emulate, yes. you know, the perfect, uh, the perfect exemplification of living out the sacrament of matrimony. Yes, I think it's a wonderful image to meditate on. I think those who don't have one should receive, obtain an icon of the Holy Family and meditate on it as Absolutely. their role models to, uh, especially if you're married, to meditate on that and try to live that out. In fact, you know what? I'm gonna state. I'm gonna start walking while you talk. You're gonna start walking. And East to West theology first. Oh, keep walking then. Walk to walk. Talk to talk. Yeah. Pull something in here from off camera. Look at that. This was uh, boom obtained in. Uh, oh, where was this? This uh, this was obtained in the Basilica of Saint Mark in Venice, Italy. Oh, okay. Yes. I, my guess was Israel. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got Venice, this. Venice, Italy. Wow. Yeah, I got this that one is in Venice. Wonderful. And that's the. Is that the water city? Indeed. Okay. Yes, the smelly, swampy city. Oh, is it? Oh, oh I, I, well, absolutely us. beautiful. Excuse no, us. absolutely Those beautiful. Those are from Venice listening. Uh, great food. Um, but yes, indeed. So anyways, there's uh, icon. there's an icon of the Holy Family as we continue. This East to West theology. Yeah. So um, I'll let you continue then since you got up and grabbed this beautiful <laughs> icon that sure. uh, we were meditating on here. We could just look at this icon the entire episode hey, and there say it is. nothing else. Hey. 
But for those who are listening via podcast, uh, we just want to say that it's a beautiful Eastern icon of St. Joseph wearing, it looks like rustic brown, and the Blessed Mother wearing her traditional red in the East, and Jesus That's wearing right. gold and sin- signifying his divinity. That's right. Uh, well, I, in the, you know, usually when Mary's wearing red, that's symbolizing her wearing divinity, putting on divinity. Where right. Jesus wears blue in the East, he's putting on humanity. In the West, it's just reversed. Reversed. Right. But here so, he's wearing gold. So I don't know. Is that, that that would mainly be just showing his his purity, ultimate purity perhaps? and divinity? I would say. Sure. But either way, uh, it's a beautiful icon with silver and gold. So uh, right. around it. Fitting for a regal family, and yet, of course, you know, paradoxically, of which you know our, our faith is just loaded with paradoxes. Uh, as we know, he came into the world uh, poor, Indeed. and and lived a spirit of poverty that is something that we all ought to uh, to live. Though the scripture says he became poor that we may become rich. It's true, but of course, we would say the interpretation of that is the spiritual sense of becoming spiritually rich in heaven right in grace in fact i was just reading about this recently ironically i've heard a case made that for those who have the ability to become rich in this life and yet choose to be poor it's actually more meritorious than somebody who may actually struggle throughout their life genuinely poor really and it's yeah dep- but i think it it, sense, for I things suppose. like that it all depends on your relationship mm-hmm. with virtue and detachment mm-hmm. Right? And, right, and becoming as magnanimous in that as uh, one state in life allows. Correct, yes, and again, we can debate that, but... Uh, sure. Well, I think it makes sense, though. Uh, it struck me just now that Jesus was rich. I mean, he's God, he is everything. So Absolutely. he literally Perfect became, knowledge. So he became poor. Throughout his entire it's, earthly existence. It's not that he was always poor. Though Blessed Mother and St. Joseph were always poor, so you have both worlds that we can deal with. So those who are poor and struggle throughout their lives, it's very meritorious. And those who are rich and give that up, it's also very, very meritorious. We don't have to totally. We don't have to compare the two, but uh, no, not at all. They're just both very impressive. There's and, just hope either way. Yes, but the scripture does state, since we're on that topic, um, and we don't want to get off topic too much, but it does say in Sirach, I believe it is, that. Being rich or wealthy is actually a good thing from the Lord, it says, if you don't obtain that through, by means of sin. And in the ancient world, the reason why the Bible was so strict against wealth was simply because in order to become wealthy in the ancient world, you had to defraud, you had to steal from the poor and from others. I mean, look at the tax collectors, for example. Sure. And so that's one perspective on why jesus was so strict with the rich and the wealthy was because they became that way through evil means sure. but, but there and we are, see that with yeah. the, the reference to blood money as well just being cognizant right. of of mm-hmm. means and ends so uh to get back on our topic of the well, relationship yeah yeah but i just want to say for the easterners out there i would, would like to at some point uh in the future when we get on the church fathers to you know at some point uh talk about that as well as it's an interesting a facet of uh, developmental theology and and theology as such so Sorovia, yeah. here's to it yes if uh, we can get to that in the future that'd be great but we'll see what we can do so. as will be done yeah i think as we uh progress uh onto the saints in general of course the patristic fathers are mm-hmm. going to have a very special place in that conversation right, so I'm, I'm very happy to have that conversation right yes um but really, it, it kind of stems from Mary and Joseph. We're just going to keep looking this way the whole uh, rest of the video. I, just, I, I can't take my eyes I hope, off. The I know. I hope. I hope everybody uh, can just appreciate this ad orientum presentation that we're going to give you today. <laughs> yes. So, <indeed. laughs> yes. Um, so back to the heart of the Holy Family. Right. Indeed. So as we touched on the last couple of videos, we touched on Mariology proper and then specifically Marian apparitions. Mm. Um, you have, we touched on the difference between Latria, Hyperdulia, and Dulia. Of mm. course, Latria being this Latin term for worship, mm. which is due to God alone, the Trinity right. alone. Uh, Hyperdulia, which is due to the Blessed Virgin Mary alone. Mm. Hyper meaning like, you know, the most of, you know, first and principally um above all others and then you have 
kind of sandwiched in there this interesting term protodulia. Proto actually specifically means first, first among the rest. Uh, proto, dulia, uh, veneration, mm -hmm. right? Hyperdulia, protodulia, and dulia being Greek terms, right. uh, meaning veneration of different levels, different hierarchies. And the protodulia is due to Saint Joseph alone. So, and that of course is a is a topic of debate among certain Western and Eastern Catholics as to whether Saint Joseph is truly the high, the third highest in heaven, you know, after, you know, the Trinity, Mary, and, um, and then Joseph taking the third place, or is it St. John the Baptist? Again, another topic for another time. We're going to shelve that for now. Well, potentially but, we can discuss that in the future. Yeah. Ab yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Potentially. Um, but regardless, the fact remains, there's this beautiful theological tradition and ongoing conversation where, Regardless, we acknowledge that St. Joseph holds a very, very high mm. place in heaven, if not the most high next to Mary. Right. Uh, and, and that really stems from the hypostatic order, mm. right? You've got the hypostatic union, right? Which is uh, Trinity focused, Trinitarian, right? Uh, well, the hypostatic union actually refers to Christ's uh, two natures. Right. Yeah, yeah. Human sure, divine, divine nature and human nature. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Council, uh, but, it, but there's a connection Pope to the Trinity Pope there, because through his divinity, that that involves his connection to God the Father. Well, the consubstantial Trinity, um, yes, I mean, hypostatic. I would just would have to meditate on that, whether we can use that for the Trinity. But I see what you're saying. There, of course, there's a connection there. Absolutely. You're not out of the ballpark. I mean, right. you know, Christ makes up... Um, you know the second person of the Trinity, so right. this hypostatic union would thereby be connected with uh, the Holy Trinity as such. Right, but that's a mystery, of course. To delve. Sure, and that I guess it, to me in my childlike state, that's that's what makes sense to me. Of course, it, it has yeah. to do with Christ's divinity versus Christ's humanity, and how those interplay throughout His earthly existence and in general, and then of course how it connects to the rest of us by being uh small christ's divine participators mm. by adoption mm. right we don't we don't participate in the hypostatic union in that way we can experience divinity by grace correct so uh yeah in, in some sense that's all connected but then there's this separate concept called hypostatic order mm. and and that pertains to the relationship in the holy family right so would you like to touch on that or well yeah sure i would love to touch on that so you have saint joseph who's the head of the holy family which is really cool to think about so because right. he's third yeah right in, holiness, in the order of grace in order of grace right? out he's of the three christ Mary, saint joseph obviously because he's fully human in all ways and he was not immaculately conceived as the blessed mother was which again potentially we can discuss uh the eastern perspective on that but as sure. Catholics, yeah, we, we must accept that, right. Eastern or West. So, uh, but for our Orthodox brethren who are tuning in, I would love to get into that uh, at some point if we can. Well, it, let me ask the question right now, because I don't know, and maybe this does or doesn't touch on it. Um, as a Western Catholic who has a limited understanding of the Eastern perspective on St. Joseph, uh, what is that like Josephology? I don't even know if there's a, 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 a term I don't know if that's as a, such for it. Term, yeah, but sure, yeah. So um, Josephology, in yeah, Hebrew, Yosef. In, indeed, indeed. Um, is is there an Eastern tradition that Saint Joseph at some point was cleansed of his original yes. sin? Yeah, I even before birth or hmm. upon conception. How does that work? Oh well, that's an interesting point. Um, whether he was deemed that way or not uh, by birth. We're gonna when we when we jump into the church fathers, we could um, well potentially when we do, and I I would think that we would sure. on this show. But, it's all uh, God's grace. All God's grace, but that we don't uh, get hit by a milk truck tomorrow. I know exactly that we would love to <laughs> uh, touch on that some more exactly, but uh, but you know what? Again, let me just I don't want to get off track too much uh, with Saint Joseph because we're trying to talk about the hypostatic, um, not or, the hypostatic union order. With, with Christ and his two natures but with the hypostatic order with the holy family and the fact is that he's human and divine which is really amazing because in his divine nature he's connected as the holy trinity right father son holy spirit but in his human nature now he's connected with the holy family right saint joseph mary and himself 
So father, mother, son, son. And again, there's so much to unpack there, but I'd like to just begin by stating how with St. Joseph, again, he's the head of the family, though he's the lowest in order of grace, but by authority, he's the head highest and he's representing uh, God, the father. Right. And so connecting the Holy Trinity with the Holy family, we have God, the father and St. Joseph being uh, St. Joseph being a mirror or an image or reflection of God, the father. We have Jesus, who is the son, reflecting who he, who he is, the son. So he's the same son. So that's the amazing point about that is the connection between the Holy Family and the Holy Trinity. That this, this one person in Christ connects them both intimately right. for all ages to come. And then you have the Blessed Mother who represents or is a reflection of the Holy Spirit. Anuma, right, in the Greek, I believe, is uh, the word for spirit. That's right. And Ruach in the Hebrew. Ruach in Hebrew. Thank you. Uh, but the pneuma in the Greek, and you know, I'm you know, I'm Greek, so Greek Indeed. Catholic. Indeed. But uh, we have the word for spirit is feminine or either neutral, right? And that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is a female. No, it's just showing the motherly angle of God, because God is the author of both male and female. So he contains within himself both those aspects, male and female, in the sense that he created both of them. Um, and the Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit would be, would be, uh, would have that reflection. The Blessed Mother had the reflection of the Holy Spirit, who is in scripture used or termed as a female term uh, sure. at times. And and there is an intimate connection there as well. I mean, and I'm tempted to get into it, but I don't well, let want me to, let me ask this right kind now, of innocent. Deep, let me ask this innocent question, just kitten playing off what you just said. Um, obviously, I've I've done some research on Saint Maximilian Kolbe and familiar with his tremendous contributions to Mariology. Francis, you know, uh, really unpacking what it means to be the Immaculata. Uh, is it a fair characterization, or, or would I be getting in hot water with? the technical theological precision, uh, like with the hypostatic union to say that there's kind of like a relationship with the blessed mother in, there's almost like an allegorical connection of that hypostatic, you know, like the divine and the human nature where she has this divine spousehood with the Holy Spirit and a human spousehood with St. Joseph. Exactly what I was apprehensive about entering into okay well there you go but let's do it <laughs> holy spirit right there we're still moving like i mentioned in the beginning of this episode we're still moving from mariology into yosephology as we're <laughs> coining the term here on <laughs> east to west theology okay um so this is the this is the uh, mutual point this episode and yeah sure let's get into that a little bit okay so the fact is the holy family we have uh the blessed mother being Yes, she is representing the Holy Spirit in the Holy Family as being the female, being the mother, um, and also being the one that gives life as the Holy Spirit gives life. Throughout Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit is the person of the Godhead who gives life. And here, the Blessed Mother is giving life, uh, the Holy Theotokos. And what we have now is what Kyle Dean brought up, which is a very deep point of view and not many people know of it, unfortunately, but it's a Franciscan view, which for those Easterners out there, the Franciscans, they have the school of thought different from the Thomistic school of thought, which they have a school of thought, which delves more into the Eastern fathers. What does? The, the Franciscan? Franciscans. Whereas Thomas is heavily on Augustine only. Um, and that's one point of contention between the Franciscan scholars, the scholastics. Wait, wait, and the Thomas Thomistic. is heavy on Augustine? Yes, very much it, so. Well, Augustine is Platonic, and the Franciscans, my understanding is, have generally gone to, they've, they reach back to the Platonic school of thought, whereas St. Thomas Aquinas is more uh, Aristotelian. Aristotelian. Well, and, and Augustine, you know, he touches on both, but I thought he was leaning more towards the Platonic. But though, though even if he were leaning more toward the platonic, which is a philosophical, you know, uh, discussion, the point is Thomas does weigh heavily on Augustine. Yeah. Oh well, as yes. he has, I mean, he's and the doctor he, of theology, Aris Aristotelian. So as he should, yes. I, well, I, well, I, when you said that, I just wondered, and I don't know whether you can speak to this now. Is there more of a connection in the Eastern Catholic tradition to Platonism? Uh, well. 
or at least among some of the early church fathers, that maybe there was some progression Not from there? Not uh, necessarily. Well, we can touch on that another time because sure. that's derailing the conversation. Okay. But just one thing for everyone to chew on is that the East doesn't the East doesn't like to delve into philosophy as much as the West. And mm. there are some fathers like Tertullian even who condemned uh, philosophical undertakings in a large part. I could see that. I'm, I'm quoting fairly, scripture, in fact. Yes. I'm fairly familiar with um, uh, Gregory Palamas and his triads. Mm. And he right. touches on that in the triads, actually, in what is that, the 13, 1400s, right. where he states that um, he has this really, really interesting meditation on, you know, Unless you can rely on the philosophical and theological masters, which I mean, in, in general, that's that's true. Like you wouldn't go to a, a brain or a heart surgeon, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you, you wouldn't go for brain or heart surgery from any Joe Schmo off the street. Uh, therefore, you know, likewise, you should rely on a philosopher and or a theologian in their competence when parsing out these matters. Gregory Palamas would say, otherwise, it, there wide is the gate of awful philosophical tradition and and bad system systematic framework that you could spend a lifetime going down some chasm that's not going to lead you to life versus um extracting he has this imagery of extracting the venom out of a snake Mm -hmm. where the venom is deadly but if a master knows how to extract it and provide a serum right then then you could pass on a uh a safe sound uh rock solid philosophy correct yes upon which to build theology correct and uh, again that's something that we can possibly discuss in the future and to answer your question once again just what i'm going to give now is that the east heavily doesn't like to uh rely on philosophy because of that but okay but uh, the west the west does for sure okay and thereby i want to mention how again kudos to the franciscan uh, scholastics again who di- uh, diametrically oppose you know the Thomistic school in many ways um, they rely heavily on the Eastern Fathers and they in turn uh, focus on the Immaculate Conception and also on the fact that uh, like blessed Duns Scotus for example who was uh, the gr- great theologian who uh, I don't know how you want to word it but he he spelled out the Immaculate Conception from theology, from the the scriptural and traditional uh, perspectives, and it became a dogma of the Catholic Church, right? But he was after Aquinas as well, and, and some argue that Aquinas would, if he were around during Scotus's time, would have uh, consented to that, uh, sure. with given the knowledge that Scotus gave, uh, much much uh, solid evidence for it and, and argumentation that Aquinas wasn't aware of. Neither was Bonaventure. At sure. the time, but so what we have here is we're touching on again Mary's what Mary's divine spousalness right to the Holy Spirit, and how it was a Franciscan Saint Maximilian and Kolbe who developed this doctrine of her being the divine spouse of well her being <clears throat> excuse me her having a divine spouse in the Holy Spirit while having a human spouse in St. Joseph. And and again, I want it for the Easterners out there, I'm, I'm prefacing this because I want them to take the Franciscans seriously that they do heavily rely on the Eastern Fathers in their theological undertakings. Hence That's why maybe you should consider looking into the Franciscan theology much more, uh, which came about after the schism, unfortunately. Sure. <clears throat> so, so anyway, uh, regarding Mary being the spouse of the Holy Spirit, yes, it makes sense that she is because, well, she was the mother of Christ. Well, who's the father of Christ, right? Well, who is the one that impregnated the Blessed Mother? It wasn't St. Joseph. It was right, the Holy Ghost. Virgin. Right? It was the Holy Ghost, it says in Scripture, that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, right? Which is a marital term given in Scripture. Overshadowing means... You know, to come into. Yes. Thank you. Sure. And it's just an image. I'll go there like, for well, you. How could we imagine that with, with God and the Blessed Mother? And it's not like some distorted Greek mythology where Zeus is, you know, you know, doing what he does, let's just say. Um, no, this is not. This is a pure spiritual reality. And that's what gives Mary this title is that she was able to have this intimate spousal development with the blessed with um, the Holy Spirit 
And this is why we acclaim right, Mary as being spouse of the Spirit at the same time being spouse of St. Joseph. And I would like you to continue further on d- discussing how St. Maximilian Kolbe, the Franciscan, delves into this. But first, what does Zeus do? Well, just kidding. So um, I, I am happy to delve into that, but I want to first give St. Joseph a, a, he drinks wine. a little bit more of a focus as we uh, close out this discussion. And so I, 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 maybe we can uh, lay the groundwork for our viewers. How do you go from this handmaiden of Israel, mm-hmm. this teenage young woman right. uh, who has very, very few, but some very profound, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the most profound uh, contributions to sacred scripture to her husband that has not uttered a single word in sacred scripture? How do we have such a rich theology of St. Joseph? Like I've read various tomes on him, and in one there was this emphasis on him essentially being the first to, to touch our Eucharistic Lord in the sense of being there for the birth of our Savior. Now, that being said, I've spoken to uh, very well catechized mm. priests that have said there, even there, there's a distinction between the Western understanding of what may have happened in the nativity mm-hmm. and an Eastern understanding that Jesus was so holy and perfect that maybe St. Joseph didn't uh, participate physically in his birth. But regardless, the point is, is that there are these theological, uh, there's, there's a, a vast theology, some of which is agreed upon, defined, uh, others, which are these ongoing opinions or disputations that are mm-hmm. taking place, uh, where do we even begin? Well, I mean, we may have to delve. We, we may have to uh, delve into this more in the future. But uh, there's so much to discuss regarding Saint Joseph. I think that one thing that we should focus on now, with the limited time that we have to share with our audience, is that. And again, like you're posing something that's a, a, a mountain to climb. Right uh, in theology, but in what's the elevator version? <laughs> well, I, I just want I want the audience to focus on a few different points here. Sure, that Saint Joseph he didn't speak a word in the Scripture. Mary spoke a few words. Jesus spoke many words. Mm-hmm. The point of the matter is that Saint Joseph is highly esteemed as being intimately united with both the God Man and the Immaculate Conception. And in the tradition of the Catholic Church. He is seen as at least not sinning personally, or if he did, maybe a few venial sins, right? But we want to focus on the fact that this great man was the one who led Jesus and Mary to Egypt back again from Herod's wrath and saved the Messiah, right? He's the one that he he was a typology, if you will, the foreshadowing. The foreshadowing of him was St. Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis to where he led the Israelites to Egypt for for bread, for for safety during the five year, I believe, famine. And this St. Joseph led Christ, who's the bread of life, to Egypt, right? And protected that, uh, the the future Israel, the new Israel, right? Into the promised land back again to Israel um, from Egypt. Beautiful connection. And that, you know, brings us back to, uh, we can can draw that connection out to our video on Mariology, really emphasizing uh, about how the whole kingdom of Israel was a type. Mm. And you had the Queen Mother in the Old Testament, which yes. helps us to understand, of course, how she is the mother of God, mm. as defined by the Council of Ephesus, of course, shortest council of all councils, 24 hours long. Like, done deal, it's the mother of God, Theotokos. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Four, that, 430 AD, I believe it was. Right, so the connection to, you know, St. Joseph uh, as an archetype and the type of uh, the other St. Joseph prefigured in the Old Testament. Of course, the distinction's uncanny. Another one, of course, would be, you know, drawing uh, Blessed Abraham in in the Old Testament and his relationship with Isaac and climbing the Mount Moriah Moriah to, uh, of course, the sacrifice of our Lord on Calvary. Right. So So it's important to connect, to utilize sacred scripture and to have that right interpretation Mm. to learn more about St. Joseph, Mm. uh, the most chaste spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, so to to bring this all to a close, just to just to meditate back very simply and beautifully on how Mary and Joseph are 
basically the perfect, the most perfect married couple that ever has been and ever will be, right? There's this kind of modernist understanding that, oh, well, the way things were done back then can't really, we, we can relate to it as, a, as maybe an ideal, but not necessarily something attainable or even something pragmatic for this day and age because that was so long ago and that was such a different culture. That's a very man-focused way of interpreting or thinking about like it. human, yeah. Here's a more God-focused, you know, wisdom, the seventh highest gift mm. of the Holy Spirit. Uh, of course, being, understanding God has, as how God understands himself. Um, God chose out of all cultures and in all times. times and spaces and eras that era to bring about mm. these life lessons a, a lot of modernists don't can't, can't even wrap their mind around that mm. because of course you have to accept that there is a god mm. some omnipotent being that is capable of a decision so mm. vast right in the first place but right. no matter what kind of crazy like technological advances and and the next leap after the internet and the industrial revolution whatever it might be and the manner in which we live our lives day to day doesn't hold a candle to the universal realities that you can draw out of what happened in that generation that's a beautiful point for our listeners because i've never even considered that point that god chose that time purposely a hundred percent and Oh, with is, its with its understanding of spousal relations, mm. the relationship between man and woman, I mean, just there, there's an almost an infinitude of though I do wanna, angles. No, though, though, though I do want to argue for the sake of the viewers that that was coming from a pre-Christ era, right? So Christ did bring about a new understanding. Like Absolutely. That's why that's why Saint Paul writes what he writes in the scriptures because there is this new understanding with Christ that wasn't there in the Jewish culture even. Right. And and of course, we're talking about, and, and that's, again, this is why you don't go to Joe Schmo on the street for brain surgery. Um, it's it's the the realm of the theologians, and, and of course, principally the, the clergy, the, the princes of the church, at, at the first and foremost, mm. the primates, in order to, yeah. um, to really parse out the tradition of our church right. and and to interpret it correctly through the magisterium mm -hmm. uh, but that being said yeah being able to make those distinctions between a culture that's relevant for the day for the day versus the archetypal universal lessons mm -hmm. that ought to be brought out for the rest of mankind whether that was backwards and forwards or whether it was just forwards from the time of the new covenant right. onward because of the new uh but eternally binding uh, distinctions that right. and, and parameters that it defines. And as you mentioned, we have to look to the scripture, tradition, and magisterium in, to in total to get that proper understanding. Right. The three pillars of the church. Of what is what is for that time and what is for our time. Right. Right. So so yes, I mean, there's so much more to discuss with Saint Joseph, and I don't know. Do you have any final words for the viewers on this on this episode? I do. He's a great carpenter. I highly recommend praying a novena to him if you need uh, some good handiwork done. I actually just recently got back from Santa Fe, New Mexico, oh, really? and saw the uh, Loretto stairs nice. uh, for myself. Um, it, you know, obviously, this isn't the time or place to to get into vivid detail on on what there is mm -hmm. there, but there's so much to unpack. They have this beautiful marble looking um, altarpiece, mm -hmm. which is actually wood. They they uh, painted it to look like marble. Right. Uh, the stairs staircase itself is uh, has been studied by so many different engineers and architects. And there's a story going back to the 1800s where a mysterious man who, by faith uh, and, and private revelation, has been identified and accepted as Saint Joseph to do this carpentry work, uh, some ancient technique uh, that rested 33 stairs and on all the weight was on the bottom stair two 360 degree spirals up mm. to a choir loft because you had these nuns who uh wanted to access it in a very small chapel that did not have enough of a footprint to do a standard staircase um before that there were um male religious that and the custom back then to get up into the choir loft would be for them to climb a ladder but it was deemed unsafe for the nuns to do so uh, I don't know if that was because of their clothing or just decorum in general, but um, yeah, great carpenter. And uh, <laughs> although I, the last thing I'll say, I don't know if I've, I've never seen this publicly uh, observed before, but I noticed at the top there is a crack 
that's happening mm. and they added a metal brace onto it after the fact mm. and all i could it immediately brought me to how i don't remember if it was arsenic or what the chemical was but how over the centuries with the image of guadalupe you had mm. people like spill things on it that should have completely destroyed mm. it but it didn't completely destroy it but right. if you look in the top corner there's still that imperfection which is just an ongoing proof that we're not to be attached to these miraculous things that are handed to us for their own case, for their own sake or as such right. they are just means to a greater end to point us to our final telos to the anagogical reality of the eschaton and that we are to shoot for beatitude uh, in the eternal realm right. that everything in this life is fleeting so we need to understand even these these uh potentially miraculous uh you know certain mm. private uh revelations that need to be accepted on faith with a grain of, not with a grain of salt per se but we just need to have a right relationship with them in the grand order of things right with public revelation right so but anyways to bring it back to saint joseph and to just give a shout out to him I'm very, very thankful to have experienced your handiwork. I like how I'm looking out here like he's on the internet somewhere, like waiting, to, waiting to catch this video. He is. You know? He's everywhere, right? I, you know? In his intellect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, by God's grace, God. Well, in that it. sense, thank you right now. Yeah, it's because the saints are with us uh, in spirit uh, because God is able to elevate their intellect and their... Um, their understanding right absolutely there's this mysterious participation in divinity they're almost getting all of the intercessory prayers maybe millions a day yeah and uh filing it and acting accordingly in some yeah. supernatural mysterious manner and again that's something that saint paul says we can't imagine nope. so well thank you kyle dean and there's yeah. so much more to unpack with saint well joseph this is not even the tip of the iceberg i wouldn't even say it's, it's a tip. not but it's a it's a magnificent it, wedding of the whistle to uh to yeah. crack open to expand upon mariology and to to bring some other uh mm. heavy hitters into the uh, oh, conversation yeah. right home runners right i don't Amen. know if you're into baseball but i'm not me neither, me neither. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but we have friends who are but i, I yes and and i have teams be. i root for for my wife's sake so <laughs> So thank you for joining us on East to West Theology. Uh, Kyle, Dean, can you uh, close us off in a prayer? Sure, absolutely. Uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, now, and ever shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. amen. St. Joseph, most chaste spouse, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Nazarovia. Nazarovia. Salute. Salute. Atwe semper virgo, felix celi porta.